Father, I thank you for the day. I pray that you'd be with us as we go through your word. And Father, again, as we talk about communication, I pray that you would help us to be careful to listen well. And I pray, Lord, that, uh, that you would really help us to, to get this message that you speak about throughout your word over and over and over again. I pray that you'd speak to our hearts and our minds, Father. We thank you. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. So, you know, my question for you guys as we get started, you know, have you ever had one of those situations where you end up in an argument with somebody, and I'm sure you guys don't argue with anybody, but let's just pretend that you end up in an argument with someone, and at some point, you and the other person, whether this is a child and you, whether you are the child, whether this is a spouse, whatever, but you're in the middle of this argument. At some point, you're both just exhausted with the argument and you're looking at each other like, are we saying the same thing? Did it take us 30 minutes to realize that we're actually saying the same thing two different ways? Or maybe you've had one of those times where, again, you've had this argument and then you go and you realize that even though you have been on opposing sides of this argument, it all started because somewhere along the line, someone misunderstood something, made a bad assumption, and then everything else was built upon that false assumption. Well, again, I'm sure you guys don't have that problem, but I know it comes up in my life on a regular basis, and I'm sure, joking aside, that it comes up in yours. And so I want to start, we're gonna, I'm going to do a few verses from Song of Solomon, and I'm not going in depth into the meaning behind some of this, because as you may or may not be aware, Song of Solomon uh, is a little bit of a racy book. Um, but we're going to go in verse or chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. Again, I'm not going to give you the background, because I want to keep this super family friendly since I don't know who's listening. Um, and then I want to focus on verse 15. And then our main passage today is going to be Ephesians. So Song of Solomon 2, 11 through 15. And the little bit of background I'm going to give you, and it should be obvious as we read the first few verses, is that this is early in their relationship. Remember, Song of Solomon is in, in context, it is two lovers singing a song to each other. Okay. Now, ultimately, we know that there is typology of Christ in that book, but the actual context, it's two lovers singing a song to each other. So this is early in their relationship, so bear this in mind as we read. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. So the hard times, the loneliness, the exile, it's all over. Verse 12, the flowers have already appeared in the land. So not only is winter over, but we would call this spring because things are starting to bloom and flourish. There's a parallel here between their new young love and the uh, seasons that they're referring to, right? The flowers have already appeared. The time has arrived for pruning the vines. And the voice of the turtle dove has been heard in our land. The fig tree, now I'm not going to go in depth here, but bear in mind throughout all of scripture, the fig tree represents life. It is a very significant plant in the culture that the Bible was written in. The fig tree has ripened its figs and the vines in blossom have given forth their fragrance. And I always think of honeysuckle, right? In spring, that's one of my favorite things is when you can smell the honeysuckle. Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come along. Verse 14, O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret place of the steep pathway, let me see your form, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your form is lovely. Then verse 15, this is the one that I want to focus on. Catch the little foxes for us, the little foxes that are ruining the vineyards while our vineyards are in blossom. So catch the little foxes. There's three things. Catch the little foxes. Why? Because the little foxes are the ones that are ruining the vineyards. The third thing, while our vineyards are in blossom. Now, why is this important? A couple of things. One, this is a song. That's the reason it's called Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, depending on which uh, translation your Bible chose, right? So it's just like the Psalms. This would have originally been sung. Verse 15 is the chorus. So 
what is the main point that an author is trying to communicate when they write a song? Typically, it's the chorus because that's the part that is repeated, right? So verse 15 is the chorus of this verse. Catch the little foxes for us. The little foxes that are ruining the vineyards while our vineyards are in blossom. So what we have here is we have a picture of young love, of a fresh new beginning, and they are professing their love for each other, recognizing the beauty of this new love, this new relationship. But in verse 15, the chorus, we also have the warning, the exhortation. Um, it, it would honestly serve as both to catch the little foxes. Now, again, I don't know what background you guys have in understanding this passage. I don't know if you've ever heard anybody speak on this or if you've heard somebody speak on it a lot. But the little foxes, it, to, to jump forward because this isn't our main passage today. If I was teaching this passage, I'd go a lot more in depth. The main point is that those little foxes are ruining the vineyards while, while the vineyards are in blossom. So do you want to catch, if you're gardening or farming, do you want to catch pestilence before or after it has wrought its work? Before, right? It doesn't do any good to catch a pest after it has already ruined the crop. You need to catch it before. Well, how do you catch it before? You have to be diligent, you have to be aware, and then you have to put in the effort. And that's what it's talking about here. See, those little foxes, it's, it's a hard section to translate if I was teaching this passage because it's left vague on purpose. The little foxes, in my opinion, they represent all the little bitty things that cause those misunderstandings, that cause those, you've been saying the same thing two different ways, the same thing two different ways. See, it's those little things. See. If you've ever been through marriage counseling or you've just ever heard anybody teach on marriage and communication, you're going to understand that most arguments in a marriage, and for those of you that are not married yet, you, you will understand this someday. Listen to your parents if you don't get it yet. Most arguments in a marriage are over really silly things. Especially when a young couple first gets married, I mean, they might have a knockout, drag out fight over which way the toilet paper goes or whether you squeeze the tube of toothpaste from the bottom or the middle, right? And some of you are thinking, oh, that's horrible. Well, it depends on which side of that you're on, right? But it's those little things that we tend to end up arguing and fighting over. And any logical person would stand back and say, that makes no sense. For the sake of your marriage, is a tube of toothpaste really that important? But if you've been in any serious relationship, you understand that even though in the grand scheme that's not that important, it represents other things, as well as it's those small annoyances. It's those little things that tend to drive you crazy. That's what it's talking about, in my opinion, in verse 15, is catching those little foxes. Catching things before they become a serious problem. So let's turn now to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 25 to 32 together. And then I've got a few points that I want to make. And as I've already referenced while you're finding your place, again, Ephesians 4, 25 to 32, as I've already referenced, we're talking about communication today. And this is important in all of our lives. And Ephesians, it's specifically uh, talking about, you know, usually I would use this in a premarital counseling or a marriage counseling session. So it's talking primarily about uh, relationships and and, and, and what I would call nuclear relationships, like a husband and a wife or something along those lines. But it also has broad implications for us as a church because these are principles that Paul wants us to understand for communication in general and who inspired Scripture, God. So even though Paul's the one that wrote it, the authority is from God. So ultimately it's God wants us to understand these principles of communication. So let's read in Ephesians 4. I'll read 25 to 32, and then we're going to break it down from there. And actually, let me back up to verse 22. So that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, 
which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, or some versions say the lusts of the flesh. Verse 23, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And the reason I back this up, this is a very important uh, scripture. These two verses are exceedingly important if you want to grow in your faith. If you want to grow in depth, and actually get to know God more, and actually grow in your faith. These two verses are extremely important. In counseling, we call this putting off and putting on. Now, some of you may understand this concept generically from the old advice for smoking, right? Somebody's addicted to cigarettes, and they start telling them, well, chew a pack of gum, and then the next thing you know, they look like a five-year-old with gum all over the place, right? But it's that idea of if you're trying to forsake one thing, you need to replace it with something else. There is validity to the observation of chewing gum instead of smoking if you're trying to do that. Now, we all know that does or doesn't work at varying levels for different people. But notice the definition of repentance. You should have heard this before, but if not, repentance itself means turning from evil toward God. The repentance, the word repentance actually means to turn 180 degrees. But it's not just that you're turning away from sin, it's that you're turning toward God. So please understand these two verses. Now, why do you think these two verses are where they are? Because it's going to be important in process of communication. See, you can't have a godly conversation if you're thinking about you. You can't have a wholesome, healthy, godly conversation if you're only thinking about your perspective. See, you need to die to yourself and learn to live for others if you want quality, godly communication. When all we think about is our own perspective, when we forget that there are three sides to every story, yours, theirs, and the truth is usually somewhere in the middle. But we forget that. I think that's exactly why these verses are where they are. So verse 25, if you've never heard the joke before, it says, therefore, remember that therefore is there for a reason. The previous verses set the, con the tone, the context. So verse 25, therefore, because of all of this, therefore, laying aside falsehood, what falsehood? The idea that you can trust your own perception, it's not just talking about lying, it's the fact that we tend to think that we can trust our own perception, yet what does Jeremiah tell us and what does all of Scripture tell us? Our hearts are deceptively wicked. Who can know it? See, apart from Christ, we can't trust our heart at all because we're always going to see things through a selfish motive. We're always going to see things through a colored lens, and that color is usually what we want it to be. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor. Why? For we are members of one another. So in this church, right, we are family now. So we are all part of the same team. We need to make sure that we are pulling and communicating in the same direction. Verse 26, be angry and yet don't sin. Now, I don't know how many times in ministry and over the years, whether it was vocational or lay ministry, I don't know how many times over the years I've heard people, whether in counseling or some other context, say, well, you know, the Bible says not to get angry. No, it doesn't. In fact, it explicitly says, be angry, yet don't sin. See, anger is a human emotion. You would not be human if you never got angry. But see, we tend to think of anger as being letting our anger go, and there is a difference. See, we're not supposed to allow our anger to control us. That's the difference, and I think that's what most people mean when they say don't get angry. But here's the thing you may or may not think about. God gets angry. So if anger was always wrong, then God would have sin. If God had sin, he would not be God. If he was not God, what in the world are we doing here today? Right? Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And that's a good practice in life. As much as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. Right? You've probably heard that verse before. I think that ties in here. 
you may not be able to resolve everything before bedtime or before the sun goes down. But if you're in a relationship with anyone, you need to reconcile as quickly as possible. Even if you can't figure things out yet, commit to each other, I'm still upset, but I love you and we'll figure this out. Don't go to bed angry, as you've probably, I hope, heard people say. <coughs> Verse 27, and do not give the devil an opportunity. Why do you think that is where it is? Because of the verse immediately before. See, we want to hang on to our anger. If we're hanging on to our anger, what's going to happen? Satan's going to be whispering in our ear. We have three enemies, right? The world, the flesh, the devil. Okay? All the world is happy to see us fail. Our own flesh wants us to fail in, in our sinfulness apart from Christ. And then we have a very real enemy who wants to see us fail. He wants to see us destroyed. And guys, that is both true of us personally and as a church. Why do you think there's so much fighting in churches? Because you have a bunch of people who are trying to honor God, but we're all still sinful apart from Christ. Do not give the devil an opportunity. See, if you are wise, you will realize that we are in a spiritual war. And when these things come up, it is partly because of us and partly because we have an enemy that wants to capitalize on our failure and sow discord and distrust. Because if the devil can keep us fighting amongst ourselves, we will never reach the community, the area, and the world for Christ. And let me say that again. And this is any church. If the devil can keep us fighting amongst ourselves, we will never reach our community, our area, or the world with Christ. See, the devil is happy to have us fighting amongst ourselves because we're doing his work for him when we do that. Verse 28, he who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor. Now this directly goes to the putting off and putting on. So it's, it's, it, it's related to the main thought for today, but it's actually tied more to those previous verses. Uh, performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Let me read that again. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. See, as humans, we love gossip. I, I, I would love to pretend that I don't, I have a love-hate relationship with it. My flesh, of course, loves gossip because we're all humans and that's common to man. But the spirit hates it because it is sin and I know it's wrong. But see, it's really easy in church to gossip in a quote-unquote holy way, right? Oh, we need to pray for brother so-and-so. I heard, insert gossip. Oh, well, you know, I'm really concerned about the direction the church is going in this particular area because, insert gossip. Well, you know, I'm not really a fan of what's going on over here because, insert gossip. Let me ask you this question. If you catch yourself saying that, and I'm sure that you have because you're human, I have too. If you catch yourself saying that, let me ask the question, what is your intention in that conversation? Is your intention to create change? And by the way, I hope I don't have to qualify, but godly change, not selfish change, right? It's not about a power grab or trying to control things. Is your intention to try to build up the church? In other words, are you having that conversation with the right person at the right time to grow God's kingdom, or are you just venting to somebody because you're not happy about something? That's the difference between gossip and constructive discussion. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give what? Grace to those who hear. Verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. See, 
When we're not communicating in a godly way, that's called grieving the Holy Spirit. That is sowing, whether intentionally or not, sowing discord among God's people. Now, we also know elsewhere in Scripture, God says He is a jealous God and He cares for His people. So if any one of us is guilty of spreading gossip, if any one of us is guilty of sowing discord, if any one of us is guilty of creating dissension, we are in direct opposition to God. God is not happy with you. He is not happy with me when we are guilty of these things. So even though it is common to being a human being, it is not okay. Being a sinful wretch is common to being a human being. That doesn't mean that it's okay. That's why we need to be so very, very careful with our words and more importantly, our attitude, because Jesus also teaches us that it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but out of the heart he speaks forth. See, our words reveal our heart. We can lie to ourselves all day long, but the subject matter and the intonation of our conversation, that reveals where our heart really is. And anybody can fake it for a little while. Anybody can behave in front of certain people. But over the course of your day, your week, your month, and your life, those words bear witness to where your heart really is. In fact, if you want to know where your heart really is, catch yourself when you're having those monologues. After something happens, you catch yourself having those imaginary conversations. If you really want to know where your heart is, first pray and ask God. He'll show you. But that's a good indicator when you're having those monologues. So let's break this down a little bit. So in Ephesians 4.25, we have the command to be honest. And in this honesty, it is, it is, I see two things that are being done here. And this isn't just through this section, but also through the rest of Scripture. We have a need for accountability, right? If we're going to be honest in our communication, we have to use the one another's of Scripture, right? I've preached to you guys before out of Matthew 18, church discipline, right? And a lot of times people are afraid of that word church discipline. Well, let me ask you what happens when a child is never disciplined. Watch the news. You'll see the answer to that, right? See, if there is no discipline, we in our sinfulness go astray. So church discipline shouldn't be a bad word. But often in churches it is, and I think partly because it's misunderstood. See, if I'm having a conversation with somebody and they say something that sounds like gossip, and I say, brother or sister, I, I love you, but I'm not sure we should be talking about this. That's the first step of church discipline. See, it's that simple and natural. It is calling somebody to accountability, calling somebody to a higher calling than living in the flesh. That's church discipline. That's accountability is the word that we usually use. But that's literally the very first step to church discipline. So we need to have accountability, but we need to be honest with people when we see them. The Bible also tells us that if we see our brother sinning, I believe it's in that same passage, but don't quote me on that. If we see our brother sinning, we're supposed to go to that brother or sister and lovingly confront them. Now, I'm not talking about being God's police. I'm talking about a loving, godly conversation because you care about that person and you want what is best for them. That's accountability. See, you can't fix something if you don't know it's broken. How many times in any relationship, whether marriage, friendship, parent and child, how many times in any relationship has someone gotten upset with you, and most of the men are going to say the amens on this one, but everybody can, <clears throat> How many times has somebody been upset with you and you have a conversation and you're, you're asking the question, okay, what's wrong? I don't get it. And then you find out that that person was upset because of X, Y, or Z and you're like, oh, I had no idea. I didn't know that this was a problem. Well, why didn't you know? Well, two possibilities. One, you may not practice self-awareness. You may be one of those people, which I, un unfortunately a lot of people are not very self-aware. We all think that we are. That's something you can pray through. 
But a lot of people are not very self-aware. They don't analyze themselves from God's perspective very much. But the second reason, and the most common in those conflicts, is because nobody ever told them that there was a problem. Well, you're, most of you are sitting in your cars right now. What happens if the little lights on the dashboard start coming on? Depends on the light, right? But that's your car telling you something is wrong. See, there's a reason the engineers put those lights in there. Because if you don't know that there's a problem before it causes something major, what's going to happen? Something major is going to break. That's why those little lights come on. So don't cover them with duct tape or ignore them. Pay attention to them. Same thing in life. If somebody's trying to communicate something to you, one, we need to bear in mind that not everybody is great at communication. And a lot of people are afraid of other people. It's called fear of man in scripture. A lot of people are afraid to come to someone else with a concern because they either don't know how to have that conversation or they're just flat out scared. That's called fear of man, by the way, and we need to get over that. Again, I'm not talking about being the God police. I'm talking about loving your brother or sister. But we need accountability. You can't fix something if you don't know it's broken. Now, the counterbalance to this is humility. We need to understand that we may see something as a problem, but whose perception is that based on? Mine. If you're the one seeing a problem, that perception is based on your perception. Remember I said earlier, in most conflicts, in fact, really any conflict, there's three sides to every conflict. Person A, person B, and the truth is in the middle somewhere. Why? Because we don't have perfect perception. We also never have all the facts. And you may say to yourself, well, I'm thinking about a situation right now and I know all the facts. No, you don't. You need to have the humility to understand that you're not God. Because only God can know all the facts. And when we have this conflict or this perceived conflict, because I have found over the years that oftentimes it's a perceived conflict more than an actual conflict. But whenever we have this, we need to have the humility to understand that my perception is limited because I'm not, as, as we borrowed the expression from the Native Americans, I'm not walking in their shoes. So we need accountability, but we also need humility. That's what it's talking about in verse 25, the command to be honest. The next thing in any communication is we need to stay current. Right Now, men joke about this with women, so I will say the joke, but bear in mind it goes both ways, right? Men joke that women never forget anything, and 10 years later the same thing can come up. And while that's true, men do tend to do the same thing just differently. Why? Because we're human. See, in our sinful flesh, we want to keep a record of wrong. Why? Because we want to be self-righteous. We want to think for ourselves that this other person over here, oh, they just messed up. I'm going to put a tally mark. Oh, they messed up again. I'm going to put it, ooh, that was a big one. I'm going to put a couple of tally marks, right? And then on my side, well, I asked forgiveness, so I'm going to erase my tally mark because I'm good now. And we want to keep score. Guys, in any relationship, the moment you start keeping score, you have failed. Let me say that again. In any relationship, the moment you start keeping score, you have failed. Why? Because you are proving that you are self-righteous and more concerned about your own ego than that other person's betterment. If you are keeping score, it is because you're more concerned about your ego than the other person's betterment. Now I'm going to ask the Captain Obvious question. Which of those two honors Christ? True forgiveness, whether the other person deserves it or not, means not keeping record. Jesus explicitly tells us love keeps no record of wrong. 
right? I believe Paul penned the words, but it's ultimately through Christ because he inspired Scripture. See, I've shared this one before, but I'll share it again. One of my favorite quotes about bitterness, which is related to keeping score. You can't get bitter if you're not keeping score. One of my favorite quotes is that bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. So you grab that bottle of Roundup or antifreeze or whatever that poison is, you chug it down, and then you sit there looking, waiting for the other person to die. And lo and behold, you're the one that's dying, not them. 1 Corinthians 3.15, by the way, is that passage, keep no record of wrong. The third point, we need to attack problems and not people. And we see this in Ephesians 4, 29 and 30. Here's the crazy thing. See, our own flesh, our hearts are deceptively wicked. Who can know it? Our own flesh is so messed up and the devil is such a wily fox. See, catch the little foxes. The devil is so wily. He's not a coyote. He's a fox. He's also a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. See, he's so wily that his favorite trick is to tell you that you both want something different. When in truth, you both want the same thing. Let me ask you this question. In what marriage did both people not start wanting the same thing? Now, they may have had different goals in life. Don't, don't hear me incorrectly. Don't, don't get off track. But what is the goal when two people get married, right? Let, let's take the teenagers, the love-struck teenagers that are thinking about marriage. Mom and dad are looking at them going, this is never going to work. And the teenagers are like, all we need is love. What is it that they want out of that relationship? They want to continue feeling loved by each other, right? See, that's what brings people together, is that sense of belonging and love and acceptance. So if that's what both of you are after, why would you deliberately sabotage that by allowing these little foxes? But also, why would you deliberately sabotage that? If you're, if you're thinking, you know, okay, let's use the classic example, husband and wife and chores around the house, right? Both of you at some point are going to feel like you're doing everything around the house. I've got to change the soap dispenser again. I've got to change the toilet paper again. I've got to do this. I've got to do that, right? See, inevitably, you're going to feel like you're doing it all. Or maybe marriage isn't the best analogy for you. What about church, right? Maybe you're like, well, I guess I've got to do this again because nobody's here. What about your job, right? Well, I, I guess Joe Blow is not going to do that. I'm going to have to step in and do it yet again, even though it's not my job. Well, let me ask you this. Who's responsible for those relationships? You and the other person. Who's responsible for you? You. So whose responsibility is it? Yours. See, when we start looking at each other cross-eyed and start keeping score, we miss it. We start sabotaging the underlying foundation. We start sabotaging the goal of unity because of trivial things, the little foxes that ruin the vines. Both sides in conflict, and I'm talking typical conflict, right? Interpersonal conflict. I'm not talking about war and all of that. Both sides usually want the same thing. And I don't know how many times in counseling, whether marriage counseling, generic counseling, whatever, I don't know how many times over the years that I have worked with someone, again, whether it be a couple, any other friendship, whatever, and we finally dig down to the bottom and we find out that both of them had the same goal in mind. They just had different methods on how to get there. And that's where the conflict and the fighting started. But by the time they got down the road in their conflict and their fighting, they no longer believed that the other person wanted what's best for them. They thought the other person wanted what was best for themselves. Even though that wasn't the case. 
But because they started keeping score, because they didn't communicate biblically and faithfully, they started doubting the very motives of the other person. And let me tell you, the second you start doubting the other person's motives, it's all over short of a come to Jesus moment. Because everything they do, you are going to see through those colored glasses. You're going to see every little action through your own now false perception. Which goes back to the first point about needing to have humility. See, we ought to assume the best motives, not assume the worst motives. If you're in a relationship with somebody, whether that's a marriage, a friendship, a pastor church relationship, a deacon church relationship, a, a boss, an employee, whatever that relationship is, you ought to assume the best motives. Even if you're wrong, you will be happy and the other person will be frustrated that you're so nice. It's heaping coals from Proverbs, right? See, we ought to assume the best motives, not the worst. That's what it's talking about when it says don't give the devil a foothold, among other things. We have five points. The fourth one, don't or act, don't react in verses 31 and 32. Act, don't react. And what does that mean? It means that in much of conflict, what ends up happening is because of our false assumptions, because we are assuming the worst about the other person, we react to what we are perceiving. Now, you may or may not have heard the phrase, perception is reality. If you've never heard that phrase before, please hear it now. Perception is reality. Now, is my perception actually real reality? No, I've already talked about that. But to me, my perception is reality. Why? Because in our fleshly arrogance, we always assume that we understand perfectly or at least perfectly enough to judge someone else. Again, I've already talked about the self-righteousness. But what tends to happen is we believe our own lie or the lie that was whispered in our ear and we swallowed wholeheartedly. And then we start reacting to that. See, what happens in a marriage? Well, I had to change the toilet paper dispenser again. And if you're not married and you're laughing right now, like who argues about that? Talk to a married couple, okay? But you're upset. Oh, I had to change the toilet paper dispenser again. My spouse never does that. I'm so frustrated. Well, you know what? I'm going to stop doing this thing over here because they're not doing that. I'm going to stop doing this. And then that person notices, they didn't even notice the toilet paper thing, or you were just wrong, but they noticed that you stopped doing this other thing over here. So what do they do? Well, if he's going to be selfish, then I'm going to stop doing this. And you see how that feeds on itself. And again, that is regardless of the relationship. That can be a marriage, that can be a friendship, that can be parent and child, that can be pastor and church, deacon and church, boss and employee. All of our human relationships are subject to this. Why? Because we, apart from Christ, are wretched individuals. We need to act, not react. And what that means is we need to look for constructive ways to solve conflict. In other words, going back to the accountability. Go to that person and say, hey, can I, can I have a conversation with you? By the way, this is just good counseling advice. If you're going to ask somebody a loaded question, ask their permission for the conversation first because you don't know where their heart's at at the moment. They may have just had a really busy, crazy, bad day. They just might be cranky for some reason. Ask their permission to have a serious conversation first. And if they're not ready for a serious conversation in the moment, schedule a time together. And that may sound silly, but that will revolutionize your communication. But you need at some point to have that honest conversation and you need to have the humility to say, look, I need to share with you something that's bothering me, but I want you to know that I recognize I may be seeing things incorrectly. Here is what I'm seeing that I think is wrong, and here is why I think this is going on. And then your job is to be quiet for a minute and let the other person speak. 
Why? Because you need to have the humility to understand that your perception is flawed somewhere. Even if in the end of this conflict, the other person accepts full responsibility, that still doesn't mean that you had absolutely perfect perception. Plus, taking that method is going to be a lot more palatable. It will be a lot more acceptable to the other person. See, if you come in like a battering ram, telling them everything they've done wrong and why you're angry, that conversation's not going to go well. Why? Because they're going to react. That is why we need to act, accountability, not react. And then the last thing is we need to listen attentively. And I've kind of already touched on this. But we need to listen attentively. So let's go to James 1.19, and we're going to hear what James has to say about our communication. James 1.19, This you know, my beloved brethren, everyone must be quick to hear. Some of us may have grown up having mom, usually, or someone in our life say, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. Right? Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak. See, what we want to do is when we finally get to that person because we're afraid or because we're angry, we want to dump and unload on them and vent our frustration. And we expect them to bow down to our will and cower because we're right and they're wrong. That's not what James says. That's not what Ephesians says. And that's not honoring to Christ. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And remember, it also says in our Ephesians passage, be angry but do not sin. If somebody's genuinely wronged you, it's human and okay to be angry. It's not okay to turn that into a device for sin. Verse 20, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. See, our anger is always tainted by our sinfulness. That is why we can't just vent and dump on the other person. Also, let's read in Proverbs chapter 18. This is one of my favorite chapters. I have several favorite passages like most people. This is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. So much wisdom can be gained from Proverbs in general. And don't forget, we do still have our Proverbs series going on on Wednesday nights online. But Proverbs 18, a fool, now I don't know about you, but if Scripture's telling me what a fool is, I don't want to be that. I don't want God to tell me I'm a fool. A fool does not delight in understanding. See, somebody that wants to vent their anger, they don't want to hear anything the other person has to say. Why? Because they want to vent their anger. A fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. And see, this is sometimes, and I'm a very blunt person. I've learned to speak less blunt, but I'm a very blunt and upfront person. If you want to know what I'm thinking, ask, and I will tell you pretty straightforward. But... The fool is that person that says, well, I'm just going to speak the truth no matter what. I'm all for speaking the truth, but the Bible tells us to speak the truth in love. See, a fool does not delight in understanding. They don't desire to listen. They just want to vent. They just want to dump on other people. They only care about revealing their own mind. They're not listening, right, in conflict. How many times have you had that situation where you can clearly tell that as you're talking, the other person is not listening. They're just waiting for you to take a breath so they can share their next point of why you're wrong. Don't be that person. Verse 13, he who gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame to him. See, you have to have an understanding, going back to the humility in Ephesians, you have to have an understanding of what's going on and where the other person is coming from before it is wise to form any sort of opinion, much less to give an answer. Because we do not have perfect perception. Verse 15, the mind of the prudent acquires knowledge and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. See, we're supposed to seek knowledge. And how do we do that? By desiring it, pursuing it, and listening. In verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it 
will eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who eat and those who love it will eat its fruit. See, Scripture has a lot to say about our mouth, our tongue. Why? Because it's a revealing of our heart. We can choose to speak life, and we can choose to edify, and we can choose to build up. Or we can be a tool of the devil in our own rotten flesh and choose to gossip and tear down and destroy. That choice is ours, and the weapon of choice is our tongue. So if you choose to bless, then you will be blessed. If you choose to curse, you will be cursed. I want to encourage all of us to think carefully about our communication. And again, this is all of our relationships in life. If there's a conversation that you've been needing to have, have it, but do it in the right way. If you've been hurt, go deal with that between you and the other person. Again, I, I preached not that long ago from Matthew 18 about going to your brother in love. If you need to do that, or sister, if you need to do that, do it, but do it in the right way. And if at this moment you're not aware of any conflict or any problems, then praise God, try and keep it that way. That's the charge from Scripture. And as much as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. Two commands, the greatest, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. The second, like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. See, I wouldn't have to preach a message like this if we all actually just loved God and loved each other the way that we need to. Technically, I wouldn't have a job if we all just did that. I'd be okay with that. All right, guys, let's pray. Father, I thank you for the day. I thank you for your word. And God, I pray that you would help us to choose to communicate in a way that truly honors you in all of our relationships. And Father, help us to start in our relationship with you. So often we're not even honest with you when we're praying. We still have that self-righteousness and that piety. And God, I pray that you would break us of that habit of being dishonest in our communication with you. If we can't be honest with you, we can't be honest with anyone else. Help us, Lord, to know ourselves in light of you and help us to love each other in the way that you have commanded us to love. Father, we thank you. We do love you. And it is in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.